The old shoe salesman wasn't as spry as he used to be. A fact his aching and cracking joints made abundantly clear each and every morning as he climbed out of bed. But he found that once he got a few cups of strong coffee in him, he didn't feel all that bad. Real coffee, not chicory. Morning cup of Joe notwithstanding, the old shoe salesman still wasn't moving briskly enough to suit the loudmouth customer he was currently attending. Don't you know who I am? The blowhard bellowed. I'm Bill Dugans, and I got a mind to bust you upside the head you don't find me the boots I want. Yikes. Obviously, whoever said that the customer is always right never worked retail, and they certainly never encountered the likes of Bill Dugans. Now, I don't know what this Dugans character looked like, but I'd be willing to bet he was on the bigger side. Kind of man used to throwing his weight around and bullying those that were physically smaller or weaker than he. I mean, I think we all know the truth about bullies, right? How they're really just cowards at heart and only pick on what they perceive to be easy targets. Those whom they don't consider a threat. In this case, Bill Dugans was attempting to bully what appeared to just be a stooped over old man working at a shoe store. Ah, but looks can be deceiving. And sometimes a man will tell you all you need to know without saying a word. If only you'll pay attention. Take the old shoe salesman, for example. If the loudmouth bully had been the observant type, maybe he'd have noticed that the old man sure didn't have the looks of a guy who spent a lifetime peddling footwear. The weather-beaten skin and the wrinkles around the eyes, for instance, indicating considerable time spent out of doors. And then there's the way he walked, kind of awkward, a little bow-legged with a slight limp. A walk you'd expect from a man accustomed to long hours in the saddle as opposed to the confines of a department store. And even if Dugans had noticed the limp, he'd likely just explain it away as arthritis or old age. Never stopping to entertain the idea that maybe, just maybe, it might be the result of a hip once shattered by a 36 caliber ball. Or perhaps he would consider this and simply dismiss the salesman as being yet another washed up old veteran. Most men his age were, but hell, they was all broken down and besides, the stories they told were all lies anyway. Why, if only Bill Dugans had been around during the war, he'd have shown them damn Yankees a thing or two. <laughs> maybe. And maybe if Dugans had taken the time to speak with the other employees, he'd have gleefully sneered at the stories they told of the soft-spoken shoe salesman, who was easily startled by loud, unexpected noises. Noises of the sort that didn't have any effect whatsoever on a brave man such as Dugans. But I wonder if he would have also paid attention as the same employees spoke about how the old man never let anybody walk up too close behind him. How no matter how hard you tried, it seemed like he just always kind of knew you were there. Like he had eyes in the back of his head. And I'm fairly certain that if the old man's co-workers were to share his fondness for quoting Shakespeare or his tendency to volunteer at the church teaching Sunday school, that would have only emboldened the bully further and blind him to the signs that were clearly there and obvious for anyone willing to pay attention. Signs like the total lack of fear in the old man's eyes. And not just a lack of fear, something else. Something the bully had probably never yet encountered during one of his tirades. A twinkle of amusement. Situation had to be comical for the old shoe salesman, who hadn't always been a shoe salesman. But still, the bully had asked him a question, one that he was going to make an honest attempt at answering. Had he ever heard of this man before? The old shoe salesman wandered, turning the name over in his head, Bill Dugans. Bill Dugans. Was this here Bill Dugans around back in 61 when the old man heeded the call? Back before he found out he was a mere mortal at places like Lexington and Wilson's Creek? No, not that he could recollect. Nor could he recall anyone by the name of Dugans who rode with Captain Quantrill or Bill Anderson, especially not on that terrible day in the ravines when their ammunition ran out and they took to fighting with clubbed rifles and fists and rocks. No, the name of every man he fought with on that day was carved into the very core of his being and none of them were named Dugans. And try as he might, he just couldn't place a Dugans among those whom he accompanied to Lawrence the day he and the boys sold their souls to the devil and set the Jayhawkers straight. The old shoe salesman's mind scanned over the past few decades, remembering the faces of men he'd known. George Todd, Clell Miller, Charlie Pitts, even that brave yet foolish banker up in Minnesota by the name of Haywood. And then the other, some he couldn't quite put names to, but as far as he could remember, none of them was called Dugans. 
and they're darn sure were no Dugans present back in 82 when the old man became a temporary guest of the government, ending that long, anxious, inexorable, eternal vigil. Finally, the old shoe salesman looked up the loudmouth and replied, No, I don't think I know who you are. Do you know who I am, Mr. Dugans? Nah, who are you? My name's Frank James. Perhaps you heard of me or my brother Jesse. The story then goes that Bill Dugans all of a sudden turned pale, started trembling, and very quickly decided that he liked the boots he already had just fine. Within minutes he was gone, probably in search of a fresh pair of underwear. Or at least that's what they say. Full disclosure, I don't know how true this story is. It's just one of the many tales you can find when researching the outlaw Frank James, the brother of the notorious Jesse James. And hell, I'm not ashamed to say that I even took some liberties of my own when sharing it just now. What's not up for debate is the fact that Frank did indeed live and work in Dallas, Texas later in life, where today's story takes place. And he certainly had more than a few odd and varying jobs during these twilight years, up to and including working as a bouncer, giving lectures, picking berries, working for AT&T, punching tickets for a burlesque show, and yeah even selling shoes, before finally settling down on the old family farm in Missouri, where he died in 1915 at the age of 72. But was there ever really a Bill Dugans? That I don't know. I do think, however, that it's safe to say at some point, some cocky youngster or local bully or pompous blowhard did brush shoulders with Frank without realizing who or what he was. Maybe bumped into him in the streets or cursed at him for moving too slow. Not knowing they were just talking to a man who could kill them four times over before breakfast and then go home and sleep like a baby. Kind of makes me curious as to what Frank thought of these types. Men who wouldn't make a pimple on a tough man's ass or hold a candle to the likes of those he and Jesse once rode with. Back when the West was still wild, life was cheap, and the air was permeated with that black powder smoke. You know, a lot of people idolized the James brothers and put them up on a pedestal as freedom fighters or Robin Hood types. And that's not what I'm doing here. Frank was a killer. An extremely dangerous man, and he had been since he was old enough to shave. Quiet and sober, well-read, not given a drink nor foul language. Yet he sure as shit left many a grieving widow and mother in his wake. Even long after he could use the war as an excuse. No, Frank James was no hero. But he was a product of his times, and like I always say, history is complicated. And so are we. There are things that happen in this life that can cause people to make choices that will harden and sicken their souls. Much of the time, this leads to self-destruction and a very unhappy ending for all involved, particularly if there's no reckoning with oneself, no inner reflection. But in Frank's case, he straightened up. At least he appeared to. He took to walking the straight and narrow. He expressed regret as to his past life and was very vocal in opposing the glorification of outlaws. And as far as I'm aware, for the last three decades of Frank James's life, he was an upstanding, law-abiding, tax-paying citizen. I do think there's redemption in this world. At least I hope to God there is. For my own sake, at least. And maybe Frank James found some of that redemption in his latter years. Just keeping his head down and doing honest work and ignoring that inner voice that was surely telling him to end Bill Dugan's existence the same way that you and I would casually swat a mosquito. Historical authenticity aside, I thought this was a fun story and just something to keep in mind the next time you're out in the world feeling yourself. Maybe don't rush to anger or mouth off at a stranger no matter how unassuming they appear. There are killers among us still, just like in Bill Dugan's time, and they might not all be as patient as Frank James. Oh, and just in case you're a stickler for details, the consensus seems to be that Frank either worked at Sanger's there in downtown Dallas or a hardware store about a block away called Mitten Halls. Or both. Uh, I'll post more details in my next newsletter that you can subscribe to for free by going to wildwestjosh.substack.com or click the link in this episode's show notes. And if you're new here, hello. My name's Josh, and this is the Wild West Extravaganza. Normally, the episodes are a bit longer, and we go into a deeper dive on all things Old West. For all you repeat customers, I know, you're probably getting deja vu right about now. This is just one of those episodes I've been itching to re-record for a while, so thanks for indulging me. Have no fear, brand spanking new content coming your way muy pronto. Frank Canton and the Johnson County War Part 1, this time next week. 
Till then, please check out my website, wildwestextra.com, and while you're there, hit that contact button. Let me know what's on your mind. Remember, you can find the Wild West Extravaganza wherever you listen at podcasts. Apple, Spotify, Google, YouTube, Stitcher, Amazon. Hell, they even got my raggedy ass on Audible. All right, till next time, adios. probably getting deja vu right about now.